instance is the 4202, and it's only letting me, uh, it's only ringing one instance of 4202. Since we had three SIP phones, oh, let me see that. I logged these two in as 4202, and this is the only one that rang when she called it. Let's see, okay, cool, I like the set. 4202, 4202, did you change? The number of instances, the number, sure of the number of... Go, go back to your user profile and let's make sure that's that... That's not user. I wouldn't have thought it'd let me log into yeah, it. Yeah, I agree wasn't. with you. I would never. I would. Yeah. And it's set to one. Is that the user for yeah. two? Is that O two? Is that O one? This is down a little bit. Half a little bit now. Forty two two. That's the one. Change. Change that wow, number. It let us. Yes. Yeah, Max Simons. Yeah, I'm an idiot. Interesting that it let us log in two of them. Yeah. So it lets you log in, but because the instances were in above one. I think it depends on how you see it, because it could be that maximum simultaneous registration set to one. It's, a, it's one simultaneous registration, so that's what you're doing. You see what I'm saying? Like, it could be, it depends on how you see it. We'll see. It. We'll see. We're about to test. All right, try to dial 4202 again, please. We didn't pick the other one this time. <laughs> Dial again, they got me dial again. Oh, stayed with that one. That's interesting. All right. Let's log yeah. out the two phones and log them back in. Let's see what's happening. And call myself. Rings there. Let's see, let's try that. Let's see. What is it? Mute. Yeah, call me again. Try it with the pound. I want to see if it's going to be How that happen? I don't know. Call me again. Can I still call you? Yeah. Oh, look. Look, this is this phone. Cool. <laughs> I can't get this phone to come up, though. They're yeah, trying to they're trying to register the, yeah they're trying to CN register right because that's got to go through CN and we don't have a connection to it. You have to convert it. Can we convert it? Yeah. Um, that's more right. 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 Yeah. Let's convert it. Well, that one's audible. Is it audible? Oh, they probably want to leave this mic because we're going to build a CN. Yeah. And then we would have to convert it back to the SIP and they'll get all the All right. Did they're building? Yeah, yeah that's a weird combination of the, the stations with the same number. So that <laughs> they, they, they that. That's that's interesting. Did they change the max simultaneous? They changed it to two. Okay. And the idea that one of those could be because a before they had. So is that what it was? And they had it as <coughs> one, and when they switched it to two simultaneous. I, I'm not sure if that was a problem because oh, what I, the way I see that parameter is that if you have it set to one, right, it's going to allow you one simultaneous registration. Just so that means you really have two phones. Yeah, two you could have two. two. One extra yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Two phones were yeah. to the same. It's now, what I think important was there is that they were uh, tweaking or changing those parameters, but they never log out and log in their phones again. Mm -hmm. So oh, it started working when so we so logged the two yes. phones out, logged yes. them back in, sure. and it started working. Yeah. 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 That was way cool. Didn't refresh. Yeah, I think it was something that we We don't want to convert this to SIP because we want to use this as an example, right? Tomorrow we'll you see it as an H23 device. The CM, or CM, and so we're so going to so route between the SIP phone to the H23 phone. Okay. Which is why we can't get this thing up and running because CM is not associated. CM, yeah. And, and your CM no right now? Yeah. Your CM right now, let me see. CM is DOA. What about DOA? You don't even have a station right now. Your CM is completely empty right empty. now. Empty. So yeah. Tomorrow you'll create a station, you'll create a dial plan, a bunch of stuff because tomorrow you're going to be creating a SIP from between CM yes. and session man. That was the question by Al. Creating a SIP from. Yeah. S U N T. S U N T is the emulation. Mike, Mike's cousin. I mean, it's like a type in. S U N T. S U N T. Right. Okay, how did it go? Good? Uh, awesome. Let's see. Maybe we can finish the a little bit early. Let's see. Let's see. Actually, kind of prefer to push a little bit. That way, on Friday we leave early and we make sure that we have time to, for the move that's gonna happen. No, no, that's what I was gonna ask on Friday. What time? Will Friday we for sure at noon. Okay. Wow. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, let's see. Let's see, what can I, okay. Some things that you can see right now, when you notice the delay, that's because the phone doesn't have a dial plan yet. The dial plan will come from CM, but the phone doesn't have a dial plan yet. That's why it has a delay when you, when you just press those digits, right? The phone's, because the phone is still expecting digits. Another thing that I mentioned is that the, a visual indication that tells you that the phone is not associated with CM is an exclamation mark on the left corner of the display. See, it's a visual indication that tells you that the phone is not yet associated with CM. Oh, look at that. As you can see here in this slide, yeah, there is no CM. And since there is no CM, there is no PPM data. We haven't talked about PPM, but uh, it's because of PPM that the phone get feature buttons, that the phone get contacts, that the phone get speed up, list, a bunch of stuff. Oh, but stuff. that all is related to CM, and we don't have CM in the picture yet. That's why, that's why all you can do with those phones right now is place a call, receive a call, maybe put it on hold, uh, maybe forward that call. That functionality is probably because it's written in the phone's firmware. Mm -hmm. Okay. You were able to register your phones. Let's see what must take place before a SIP endpoint can place a call using register routing. Hmm. Authentication. Yeah, I need to authenticate the uh, synchronization station settings. Yeah. No. Oh, it's probably just A and D. See, you don't need C. to encrypt the message. You could right. use TCP, because, register. Yeah. And then yeah. that's not encrypted. Yeah, right. probably just A and C. C, replication. Yeah, you do need session mark to be replicated with whatever you configure in system mark. SIP call flow. So if you place a call right now from the SIP phone to the other SIP phone, this is what you're going to see if you trace. This is what you'll exactly see if you trace. Where's my pointer? So you'll see an invite coming from the caller going to session manager, yeah. your session manager. Session manager checks if the destination has a user profile. It finds a user profile. Not only it finds a user profile, but it finds that the destination is registered. And that's how it knows the IP address of the destination. So it simply proxies that request to the destination. It's the same invite, pretty much, to the destination. Right. In the meantime, it answers with a provisional answer it's back trying. to the caller, say, hey, I'm trying on yeah. your behalf, I'm yeah. trying. That trying is for the caller to know that it's trying not to something's happened yeah. so that a SIP timer doesn't expire. So it's trying, then at some point, the phone, the destination starts ringing, and there is a 180 ringing message, answer actually, this is an answer, going all the way back to the originator. When that hits the originator, the originator start, list, start listening to a ringback tone. In there. Yeah. yeah. Right. Which right now is n is nothing more than a wave file <laughs> being played by the phone. Right. So a wave file that has a ringback tone, and that's it. Now, when the destination answers, there is a final answer going back all the way to the originator, and that's this 200 OK goes all the way back to the originator, and then the originator acknowledges that it received a final answer by sending this acknowledge message all the way back to the destination. And we don't see it here in this slide, but it's right after they not acknowledge that the phone's interchange uh, media, in this case audio, directly between them, and they don't do it via C, but they actually use the RTP protocol, the real-time protocol. Okay, so they're talking to one another and then at some point, one of the phones hang up. Which one is the one that terminates the session? According to this slide. If you have to guess, the originator, originator right? Yeah. So you see the buy message coming from the originator and going all the way back to the destination who answers with a final answer saying 200K and the call is finished. This is a very basic call. No features were applied, you know, the, the guys just uh, talk to one another and finish that call. That's what you would see if you trace the call coming uh, coming from one of your SIP endpoints and going to the other one. If you open the invite, you're gonna see a bunch of stuff. 
First, you will see zip headers. This is what we call zip headers, what you see here in green. All of these things are zip headers. Whatever follows the invite is known as the request URI. And it's always, it always has information about the destination. That's where so that in this case, going, yeah, right, right away, you know, in this case, that the destination was 9002. Mm -hmm. And in this case, instead of a domain, there is an IP address. That's fine. But I know that the destination was 9002. Okay. I have a bunch of headers. I'll talk about some of those headers in a few minutes. And some zip messages, not all of them, but only some zip messages, not only have headers, but also they have a body. So some messages have headers. And some other messages have, no, actually, all of the zip messages have headers, but only some zip messages also have a body. In telephony, usually, the body of the message, in case the message has a body, is an SDP body. SDP stands for Session Description Protocol. And it has some information related to telephony. And actually, I would say that is the most important information because it's because of that information that the call takes place. SIP was not developed for telephony. It was de developed for communications over the internet, period. SIP is a layer seven protocol. All SIP can do is initiate a session, modify a session, and terminate a session. And notice that I'm carefully saying session, not call, because a session could be anything. I mean, it could deliver any type of media. Right. So it's because of SDP, this other protocol, that a session can be related to a telephony session, which means that it's gonna be related to a call. And I'll tell you how to read these parameters that you get to see here. But in this slide, all you see kind of in blue is SDP information. You'll see it later when we trace. Another header that you'll find here, and they're mentioning, is the PAI header, P asserted identity header. That one has information about the source, you know, the caller. So normally, right, you get to see in the request URI information about the destination, mm -hmm. and in the PAI header, it, information about the caller. So 9001. Yeah, so in this case, call. in this case, what is the PAI here? 9001 was calling 9002. Right? Now, when do SDPs get exchanged? As I said, not all of the messages have an SDP body, only some of them. In this case, when people start talking. In this case, actually, there are, there are two ways of doing this. So okay. in this case, the SDP offer happens in the invite. So if I open up the invite, I'll see an SDP body. And within that offer, the caller is gonna offer codecs to be used. It's a list of codecs that the caller is gonna, is, is offering pretty much for the call to happen. Then, if you check the 200 okay, which is the answer coming, the final answer coming from the destination, you'll find an SDP response there. And that's pretty much the destination saying, hey, out of all, of all of this list of codecs that you propose, let's use this one, okay? Where's the codec list in this instance where we don't have CM or anything? Good question. If, it's, if you have CM, it's coming from CM. If you don't have CM, it's hard-coded pretty much in the, zip, in the, in the phone's firmware. In the firmware? Okay. Yeah. So it, That's in the bin files? That's gonna be, Already, yeah, okay. that's, yeah. You have no option right now to specify, to change the list of codecs that the phone is so are offering. We, are we talking G711 at the moment? We'll see, to? we'll I'm see. Impressed. Maybe, maybe not, we'll see in a few minutes. But yeah, you have right now no option with an Avaya phone, not as you say with CM, the way we have it right now, you have no option to change those codecs. Mm. It's, not, it's not coming from the settings file, you notice how everything is disabled in that file. Yeah. It's hard-coded in, in the phone film. Now, this is known, it's not in the slide, but this is actually known as, let me actually put it here, as an early offer. In SIP, this is known as an early offer. In an early offer, you find the SDP offer in the invite and the SDP response in the 200K. 
there is another type of offering zip. Again, you don't see it in the slides. Let me just create another slide so that you, I think it's good to know. There is another type of offer in SIP known as the delayed offer. In the delayed offer, you don't see the offer in the invite. It's not in the invite. <coughs> Instead, you see the offer in the 200 OK and the SDP answer, the SDP response in the acknowledge. That's known as the delay offer. You might be thinking right now, okay, so what? Who cares? Well, notice that the main difference between the two of them is who has the final answer. If you take a look at the early offer, which is the one that you have in your book, the one who makes the final decision about the code to be used is the, uh, the destination, right? right? With this 200K, he's saying, hey, this, I mean, out of the, all of your proposal, we're gonna use this code. Okay. However, in the delayed offer, the one who has the final answer is the originator, the caller. You see? Because the offer happens in the 200K coming from the destination. Oops, I removed that. Mm -hmm. What's up? Come on. That your early offer page. I think you changed pages. Oh, God. Sorry. You're absolutely <laughs> right. I missed, missed everything up. So this one was, <laughs> now everything is. So this one is SDP response. <laughs> right? Right. And, then and when this one is, okay. this one was okay. That's okay, <laughs> but then the top was the SDP, SDP offer at the top. Yeah. Right? So when does the delay response happen? Sorry. In the delayed offer, the response oh, the happens in the acknowledge. Why would it go to a delay? And Thank you. Yeah. Why would, yeah, what, what, yeah. What, what are the what? different environments that would make that considered a delay uh, offer? For example, you're going to see that if the request is coming from CM, let's say you're placing a call from an HTTP 23 phone that goes to CM, CM converts from HTTP 23 to SIP and sends that to session manager. In this case, CM is the call. Right? So CM, you'll see, works in the delayed offer to be so that CM has the final answer about the codec to be used. Mm. So you'll see, you're gonna see today when we trace, if we end up tracing, I think we, we're gonna have time to trace, that if you have, uh, in this case, the, uh, the SIP phones not associated to CM yet, they're gonna be working in the early offer. And, but when you have the phones associated to CM, then they'll work in the delayed offer. Is that in case, like, to have one trump over the other? Like, to say that the CM says, the phone says, I'm G711, yeah. but the CM says, I'm G729, so it's gonna be G729, or? Yeah, yeah, that's to have CM, the one deciding about the codec to be right. used, even if there is other codec proposed by some other Hi. Okay. Does SIP even know if the RTP establishes or not? Uh, not through SIP, but in SDP, yeah. And I'm sorry? Remember that in SIP. Oh, in SDP. Yeah, in the SDP, you know if the call was established or, or it wasn't established. Well, actually in SIP too, I mean, because you'll see an error message coming back saying why the call why the session was not established. So, so also in SIP, you get to see if the call was established or, or not. Now, I mean, clearly this is happening, the call that you're placing right now is happening using, using SIP racer routing. I wanna talk about SIP and the principles of SIP with another group.
short, simple overview. And the only reason why we're going to do this is because I should have, you got one. It's because I want you to understand better the zip messages that you're going to be tracing. Let's see, step over here. This SIP overview is, you know, related to the SIP standard. It doesn't have anything to do with the Avaya solution. It's just all about SIP so that you're able to understand those SIP messages that we're going to be tracing. Okay, in SIP, in SIP, we have some components. And these are the components that we have. We have a, we have a user agent. If, and we have uh, different types of user agents. We have a user agent client, and that's pretty much a user agent that sends a SIP request. We have a user agent server, which is just something that receives SIP requests. <laughs> so pretty much in the Avaya solution, the user agent clients and user agent servers are the SIP phones. They behave as clients who are sending SIP requests and servers when they're receiving SIP requests, pretty much. There's another type of user agent, which is uh, the back-to-back -back user agent. And it says something that receives and forwards on SIP requests, kind of generic. Uh, in the Avaya solution, the back-to-back -back user agent is the SVC. And one thing that it doesn't say here is that the back-to-back -back user agent, or actually through the back-to-back -back user agent, you have media going through, which is the case of the SVC. Through the SBC, you have both signaling messages and media going through. Now, another component in the SIP solution is a proxy server. That's just a server that requires, it receives a request and proxies that request somewhere else. The Avaya solution, that's session manager. Redirect server. It's normally a server that receives a request and redirects the request somewhere else, usually because that's maybe the request is probably going to a domain that the server is not supposed to process, so it redirects the request somewhere else. The Avaya solution, the redirect server is also session manager. And then there is a registrar server that allows uh, SIP phone registrations. The Avaya solution, this is again session manager. Okay? So the three last, last things, proxy server, redirect server, and registrar, are done by session manager. Then the back-to-back -back user agent, is the SBC, the user agent and clients, async user agent clients and user agent service are the phones. And if we see CM, I mean, if we analyze CM, CM is another type of back-to-back -back user agent. Okay, so in this case, user A wants to communicate with user B, so it sends a request uh, to the proxy server, that request probably is going to be an invite, right? So the invite goes to the proxy server, in this case session manager, and the proxy server checks in the registrant location server if that destination has a user profile. And it <coughs> finds a user profile, well, if, if there is one, it finds it and then proxy the request to the destination. The destination answers with some provisional answers, then with a final answer, and right after the final answer, there is media directly between the two users. Remember, that media doesn't happen via SIP, but it happens via RTP, real-time protocol. SIP is very similar to HTTP. As a matter of fact, the syntaxis in HTTP was reused when SIP was developed. So you'll see messages that you probably are familiar when you surf the web like 404 address not found, or even the URI is similar to a URI in HTTP. It's not, it's not just that we see here SIP, and in HTTP we'll see HTTP colon, yeah. In SIP, every time you look at a message, you know, like if you go and grab one message without knowing what you're grabbing, that's 
either going to be a request or a response. So we only have two types of messages in C. Requests or responses. And all of those requests and responses have C headers. Okay? Here we have the request. People who develop C call them methods just because they want to be fancy, but they're just requests. Okay? 14 options. That's it. You get familiar with these 14 options, you're good. And they're actually not that hard to, to be familiar with because they're kind of intuitive. Like for example, invite. Right? That's how you invite someone to a session. Acknowledge or ACK. That's how you acknowledge that you receive a final response. Buy. That's how you terminate the session. That is already that was established. Cancel. That's how an, a session that was not yet established is terminated. You know, like for example, if I call you, Jesse, and you, you haven't answered yet, and before you answer, I hang up, you'll see a cancel, canceling that session. Options. This is the options request that I've been talking about. In SIP, the options request was created to query capabilities of a server. Avaya decided to use the options request for monitoring purposes to see if the SIP entities are up or down. It's an Avaya thing. It's not, a, it's not part of the SIP standard. Register, that's how the phone registers with session manager. Prac is pretty much the same as the acknowledge, but it stands for provisional acknowledge. It was not part of the SIP standard at the beginning, but then uh, people realized that for SIP to deal with telephony, they needed a provisional acknowledge. So acknowledge is to acknowledge that a final answer was received. Provisional acknowledge for Prac is to acknowledge that a provisional answer was received. Notify is a way for the servers to notify a change on a, on a specific event. Subscribe allows the endpoints to subscribe to different events. This is the subscription that I was talking about yesterday. Remember that I said, I said that the SIP phones register to all of the three session manners, but only subscribe to events on the primary one. So when we trace, you're gonna see that the phone tries to subscribe to five events. And it does it through this method, the subscribe method. Publish is for the, this is just for both servers and clients to publish information. Info, yeah, info, I can't remember what the info one is. Now the good thing about SIP is that if you don't remember about something, just as is happening to me right now, you can always go to the internet and get to see you know what that method is about right right now i have this sip methods document that i just got from the internet and it tells you it's kind of like this one because it gives you a brief description of each method and also the rfc that you want to read in case you want to read more about it notice that the info method sends mid session information that doesn't modify the session state okay refer Refer is the method that is used every time you want to do a call transfer. The refer method is used. Message, uh, transport instant messages using SIP. We won't see that one here. And update modifies the state of a station without changing the state of a dialogue. Uh, you're gonna see later when, we, when you feel more familiar with SIP and how about you use SIP that Avaya doesn't use the update method to modif modify the state of a session, but instead it uses a re-invite. So instead of the update, it uses a re-invite. Usually if you wanna modify the state of a session, which is normally associated to modifying SDP information within an exi existing session. So 14 methods, you know, 14 requests. That's it. Now. If you open up one of those methods, in this case, they're opening up the invite. You now know, because I mentioned it, that whatever follows the invite, in this case, is known as the request URI. And it always has information about the destination. So now I know that, I mean, without looking at anything else, that someone is trying to reach JAD at example.com. Happens to be a name, it could be an extension number, but I know that JAD at example.com is the destination. I see more headers here, and 
want to talk about them. The via header is kind of a useful one because the via header tells you where this message has been so far. Where's, what's the path that the message has followed so far? So if you see, I mean, in this example, you see the via header with an FQDN, but normally you see an IP address there. So if you see three via headers in the message, that's how you can tell easily that the message before getting here, it's been in three different places and it tells you the IP address of each place. So the via header is very useful for troubleshooting purposes because you know, ah, okay, this message before getting here, it's been here, here, and here. So each via header will give you information about where the message has been so far. From header, kind of intuitive, related to the caller. To header, kind of intuitive, related to the co-lead, the destination. Notice that in this case, the to header and the request URI kind of have the same information. Call ID. The call ID is not a caller ID. Okay, call ID is just a random number that identifies all of the messages in the same call. So all of those messages that are part of the same call will have the same call ID. Again, it's not caller ID. It's just a random number that identifies all of the messages in the same call. Command sequence is a header that identifies all of the messages within the same transaction. Because even the most basic call has two transactions. Let me show you, if I go back to this very basic call, one transaction would be this, which are all of the responses because of the invite, and then another transaction is the buy. So even the most simple, the simple call, like this one, has two transactions. Transactions, one to initiate the call, one to terminate it. So the command sequence allows you to identify all of the messages related to one specific transaction. Why that could be useful? Well, because imagine that you're tracing, and in, sometimes when you're tracing, you don't get things in order. So imagine that you're tracing, and you receive this 200, you receive a 200 OK. And now you're not sure if that 200 OK is because of this buy, or it's because of this invite. How can you tell? So what you would do is you go with that header and you check uh, the header in the buy and if it has the same number, it belongs to the buy. And that's how, you, that's how you could use that header for troubleshooting. Again, let me go back here. I'm talking about the command sequence. So all of the responses because of that invite will have the same command sequence number. Subject, well, you won't see this in, uh, this is not a real trace. This is just for academic purposes. The subject will have a subject, but this is more like if you're using SIP to, to, to carry IM, instant messages. Content type is a header that tells you if this body, sorry, if this message has an SDP body. Or actually, let me rephrase that. It tells you if there is a body. And if there is a body, it tells you the type of body. And in this case, I see it's an SDP body. Okay? And then we have the SDP body with some information that I'll talk about later. Responses. We were focusing first on methods, right? 14 methods. That's it. And I said that a, a request could be either a, sorry, a SIP message could be either a request or a response. So the requests are these 14 requests, and now we have responses. Responses are easy to identify because they always start with three digits. So if you, you see a zip message that starts with three digits, that's a response. The first digit is the class of response. So if it starts with one, it's an informational response and provisional response. If it starts with two, it's a successful response, and it's final. If it starts with three, it's a redirection response. If it starts with four, client error, five, server error, six, global failure. So I also have a, a, another document that I have handy with SIP responses. 
where I have all of the possible zip responses. You know, you see <coughs> the provisional responses that start with one, or you see the 100 trying, the 180 ringing, 183 session in progress. Okay, that's good. Then responses that start with two. Actually, the only one that I've seen is the 200 okay. Notice that the 202 ac accepted is no longer used. And the 204 no notification, I haven't seen that one yet. Then redirection responses, the ones that start with three. And most of your responses when a call doesn't go through are gonna be under these client failure responses. For example, if there is no route for session manager to communicate with that destination, you'll see this 404 note found. Only that there, is a, there are a lot of responses under the 400 range. That's why I'm saying that most of your responses will be there. For example, if you try to call a phone that has a user profile but is not registered, you'll get a 480 temporarily unavailable. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the system is down, right? Client error response just means that for some reason you were not able to reach the other phone and it tells you the reason. 500 server failure responses. I hate this one when I get 500 server internal error because you're like, okay, now what? <laughs> right? It's an internal error. And now what should I do? I don't know. Run. <laughs> and then global <laughs> failure responses. <laughs> All of those responses that start with six. Okay? So those are the responses. They always start with three digits. Here's an example. Here's an example of a uh, response, they're analyzing at 200 OK. Notice that the responses will have VIA headers. It's two places. Huh? Oh. And in this case, it has two VIA headers. Two, two VIA headers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, so this message has been in two different places before it got here. And in this case, the 200 OK has SDP information. Yeah. Headers. So there are general headers, which are headers that you find in both responses and requests. Entity headers, which are headers that always tell you some information about the body, the message body. And then headers that you only find on requests and headers that you only find on responses. Take a look at this. This is actually a better, uh, better way to visualize this. So zip headers. The general headers that you see here are headers that you find in both responses and requests. Entity headers are headers that are always related to the type of SDP, to, sorry, the type of body that you have. In telephony, it's gonna be an SDP body. Mm -hmm. Request headers, headers that you only find on request, and response headers, headers that you only find on responses. Here are some basic zip headers. I kind of already talked about them. Remember, call ID is not caller ID. It's a random number that identifies all of the zip messages within one call. Contact, I didn't talk about that one, but that one says contains locations. And it has the IP address of the caller, and when, when it's in a response, it has the IP address of the callee, the destination. You'll find that information there. Avaya uses the contact header to store information in call logs. So if you ever have a problem, where you see that the call log is not correctly created. You know, it may have some garbage or, or some misleading information. Check the contact header, because maybe the contact header is not, it was not well created and it's having some garbage there. Content length header, well, indicates the message body length invite. That one is actually not that useful. The content type tells you the type of uh, body that the message has. Command sequence identifies the, uniquely identifies a request within a call ID. So that actually identifies the transaction. Remember, you could have multiple transactions within one call. From header, well, that one is intuitive, has information about the caller. Uh, require, don't remember that one, so let me just read it. Used by clients to tell the user agent server 
about options that the server expects the server to support in order to properly process the request. Okay. Subject indicates the nature of the call. Two specifies the destination and via, as I said before, indicates the path taken by the request so far. Now, we have this example here. It's a, it's a classic example known as when Alice calls Bob and it's actually part of the RFC where uh, the RFC, the SIP RFC where they explain SIP. So in this case, Alice is using a sub phone. She's related to one proxy server. Remember that this is gonna be one session manager in our case. And Bob is associated to a completely different proxy server. So Alice, is, Alice tries to reach phone, dials phone extension number. The invite goes to the atlanta.com proxy server, which is Alice's uh, proxy server. That proxy server doesn't find Bob there. So it uses a network routing policy to send that request to the other proxy server. And then the byloxy.com proxy server checks if Bob has a user profile there. It finds a user profile, so it sends the invite to Bob now using SIP registry routing. In the meantime, there are some provisional messages going back to Alice, right? 100 trying and also going back to atlanta.com proxy server. Now you know those are provisional messages because they start with one. There's another provisional message, 180 ringing, when Bob's phone starts to ring, and that goes all the way back to Alice so that Alice is listening to a ring back tone. Okay, that's good. When Bob answers, Bob sends a 200 okay, which now you know is a final answer and is successful it's a successful final answer. That means that, yeah, that guy was able to answer and now that goes all the way back to Alice who answers with an acknowledge, acknowledging that it received a final answer. Then you see media interchange between the two users via RTP, not SIP, but RTP. Then you see that Bob finished the call and there's something missing here in this slide. It makes you think that the byte goes directly between two users, but you should see the byte being sent through the proxy servers. Mm -hmm. We're just missing these dividers here, right. okay? Because both the byte and the last 200K go through the proxy servers as well. Now, they're analyzing the invite. Let's take a look at this. And actually, the slide is not, doesn't have the best format. Let me just expand a little bit. Because it makes you think that, notice that if I expand it, now you get to see that there's only one via head. All right. Okay? Mm. So let's take a look at that invite. And let me ask you a question. That invite that I'm looking at right now, take a look at this. Am I looking at this invite, this invite, or this invite? Let's go back to it. Am I looking at the first one, the second one, or the third one? What do you think? The third? What makes you think it's the third? Probably Loxy. <laughs> no, the invite originally would have had Bob Loxy, but it's got to be at least the second or third because the VIA says that it's already hit Atlanta. Right. So the it's PC, be past take Atlanta. a look at the VIA. It says pc33.atlanta.com. How many VIA headers you found here? You see, only one. Only one. Only one. So oh. actually, it's this invite. Okay, it so only has the VIA header name. related to Alice's cell phone. If I were looking at the second invite, I would see two VIA headers. And if I were looking at the third one, I would see three VIA headers. You see? So we can right away see that that's actually referring to the very first invite. Because mm -hmm. it only has one VIA header. And it says pc33.atlanta.com. Sometimes you find an FQDN. Sometimes you find an IP address. In this case, it's an FQDN. Let's see, max forwards, set to 70. That's another SIP header that used for loop prevention. So every time this message moves to the next place, that number is decreased by one. Okay, max forwards is used for loop prevention. Uh, two, the two headers going to Bob from Alice. Call ID, again, notice that it's just this random number identifying all of the messages. 
in this call, command sequence, all of the messages, all of the responses because of this invite will have the same command sequence number. Okay, so if I were to take a look at the 180 ringing, 100 trying, 200 okay, all of those responses happen because of the invite and are part of the same transaction. So they will have the same command sequence. Contact, in this case, has information about Alice. Normally, here you don't see an, I, uh, an FQDM, but you see an IP address, and that's the IP address of Alice's sub phone. Content type says that this message has a body, and the type of body is SDP. We don't get to see it here, but I know that this message has an SDP body. And then content length, just tell me the amount of bytes for that body. Now, you're analyzing the 200 OK. And that 200 OK, how many via headers it has? Three. Three. Yeah. It's going to be a tricky question. <laughs> Am I looking at this 200 OK, this 200 OK, or this 200 OK? The go question is, the yeah, if you go and check the page 15, you get to see the 200 OK. And it has three via headers. The question is, am I looking at this 200 OK, yes. this one here, or this one here? Which one you think? The one this one here? Yeah. And the yeah. answer is yes. Because, it looks because like the for responses, yeah, the, for responses, is, it works the other way around. Right. So in this case, we see the three via headers so that the message, the response can go back the same way it came in. Mm -hmm. So this one will have three via headers. When it gets to the Biloxi server, biloxi.com, the Biloxi server will remove the via header on top, which is gonna be the one related to itself. I mean, right? So the biloxi.com will remove this header then the, the Atlanta will remove this header, the, and then finally, when the phone, when it gets to Alice's phone, it will remove that via header. So you were absolutely right. I mean, that 200 OK is this 200 OK, because it has those three headers. OK, SDP. Session Description Protocol. As I said before, it's in the SDP protocol where we actually associate, associate uh, SIP with telephony. So we have all of these SDP fields, and I find this hard to remember. You know, I always have to come back here to it. Because V, well, V is for version, O for owner, creator. I mean, there are all of these different options that you see here. Right? I want to give you or tell you the ones that I think are the most useful options in, in SDP. V, not very useful. Let's just show the current version of SDP, which happens to be zero. <laughs> version zero. Huh? O stands for owner. I find that one to be useful because at the very end of that one, you're going to find an IP address. And that's going to be the IP address of the element uh, providing signaling. So, if that call is coming from CM, here you'll find the IP address of either the CLAN that's providing the signaling, or the processor Ethernet providing that signaling. It's either going to be an IP address of a CLAN or processor Ethernet. That's here. Oh, another one that I find useful is C. Let's see. C stands for connection information. I found it useful because, again, at the very end, you find an IP address. And that's going to be the IP address of the element providing the DSP channels. Useful, because now if you have a call with no sound, let's say, maybe it's a bad DSP channel. And if you look at that IP address, it'll tell you the IP address of that element providing you the DSP channel. In Avaya, that could be what? The media gateway? a port network, right, with actually the Metro in a port network, Metro, yeah. and it could be also the new Avaya or a media server. So I find that one very useful, you know? 
it'll give you the IP address of the element providing the DSP channel. And then another one that is very important is M, stands for media. And here is where you get to see the RTP port that's gonna be used, but also the code that's gonna be proposed. If you were looking here as the SDP offer, you would get to see a list of codecs. It's kind of hard to tell right now because codec zero means nothing, but you're gonna see later that zero is mapped to, let's say, G711. And there are different mapping. You don't need to remember the mapping because when you trace, you get to see uh, how everything is mapped. But in media, I'll point it out later, is where you get to see the codec that's, uh, or the codec or the list of codecs proposed for this session. In this case, I can tell right away that this is a video call, because not only has a codec for audio, but also a codec for a video. Now, SBCs, we just have some generic information about the SBC, because this is not an SBC class. Just reminded you that through the SBC, you have not only signaling messages, those being SIP messages, but also you have the media stream. You know, you have those RTP messages going through the SBC. Uh, let's see, usually reside between two service providers in a peer-to-peer -peer environment. Yeah, usually you have your SBC, but the provider has an SBC as well to protect from you. <laughs> you know, so you end up having your SBC and on the other end, the provider has an SBC as well. The SBCs provide security, connectivity, quality of service, yep. Regulatory statistics, yep. A session border controller, as I said, it's kind of a generic information about the SBC. It just, remember that it just controls sessions in the border. It's a way for you to control sessions in the border. Acts on behalf of the call it IP phone. Uh, when it's used with SIP, it works as the back-to-back -back user agent. It could redirect media for some purposes, like for example, call recording. In the Avaya world, for you to have the SBC redirecting media somewhere else, I think that you need uh, the advanced license. Not the basic license, but the advanced license. Remember that the SBC does not net rather translation because you need to convert between your private IP addresses to public IP addresses, right? Let's see, let me actually go, so well, some issues. It can extend the length of the media packet and it increases delay of voice packets. I mean, the fact that it has to do not inserts a tiny delay that maybe is not noticeable, but it's there. Right. Because it needs to do that conversion for every single packet. Remember, we're talking about real-time applications. I mean, voice is a real-time application. So it needs to convert every packet from private to public. to public and vice versa. And even though these servers are very powerful, you know, that still induces a tiny delay. Now, we have some slides that were added recently to this presentation, uh, talking about IP version 6 and beyond. Just because uh, the guy who created this wanted you to know that if we were all working in IP version 6, we wouldn't need to do NAT in the SBC, because everything would have a public routable, routable IP address. But the fact that we're using still IP version 4 is what makes us do NAT because we cannot assign a public IP address to each element in the enterprise. Because we run out of IP addresses. Right, but right. If, you, if we were using IP version 6, everything could be routed right, right away in IP, the public IPv6 domain. IPv6 will have, every laptop is gonna have a true public routable? It could be, yeah. Because well, as we're gonna see in the next slides, there's so many uh, IP addresses with version 6 that you could potentially, I think that there is one saying that you could potentially assign it IP address to every star in the universe. Something like that. You're going to see the presentation. It's kind of fun. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's huge, but how is that going to be managed? Uh, I mean, if I have 
in my office an IPv6 and you have to end over at your shop to have my same IPv6 address. Yeah, I mean, there could be, now it opens the door, it's for security concerns if you're completely exposed right. in the internet. But that's, let's say, another conversation. Yeah, but in terms of NAT, to, no, 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 but it's a good conversation. Please. In terms, I mean, the good thing is that if you are able to assign to your devices, all of your devices, a public IP, then you, you don't need, need to do any conversions, right? Yeah. And that then uh, doesn't, you know, takes out of the picture those delays that are induced because of NAT. Let me see, so let me show you some, some information here. So yeah, we use IP version four right now for most of the stuff. The problem with that approach, this kind of like a story that they tell, you know, they're just talking about IP version four and every time we go out of our private network, we need to convert to a public routable address. That's exactly what NAT does, right? So let's see. I mean, bottom line, we end up in IP version four with this amount of public routable IPs. At some point, we thought we humans thought that that was enough, but it was not enough. And there is a IP IP address what IP version four address exhaustion. Mm -hmm. So well, we are in trouble. Well, that hasn't happened as quickly as people are saying. <laughs> Come on. So. We're able to do things right now with that with the, that many IP addresses because we have network address <laughs> translation, right? And we convert from public, sorry, from private to public. And I mean, that doesn't completely solve the problem, especially if you're using zip, because NAT extends the packet path length and in zip that induces a delay, you know? Barely noticeable, but it's there. So, I mean, I'm gonna go quickly through this. The solution could be IP version six. With IP version six, we have a lot of IP addresses. We don't work with binary, but with, how you said this, hexadecimal? Hexadecimal. hexadecimal. Okay, yeah. yep. And this is an example of an IP version four address, and this is an example of IP version six. Okay. Where we end up with this so amount of options up here. Up to 79 octillion. Yeah. Up to 79 octillion yeah. IP addresses. Yeah. Explain, explain some of that masking to me on that. Okay. Here's some of the issues of why we cannot go right away with IP version mm -hmm. 6. Uh, this is the one that I was looking at. If we were working with IP address version six, we would have enough to assign six IP version six addresses to every known star in the universe. <laughs> I just think that's funny. <coughs> <coughs> if we have IP version six, we wouldn't need to do that. But then, as you said, yeah, we would be probably talking about some other concerns, you know, about yeah. security concerns if you're comp if all of your devices on the, yeah, all of your devices on the private network are completely